We're in the home stretch, folks. Woo! The breakdown. I see daylight. Now. Oh, my goodness. Welcome to The Breakdown. I'm Tara Setmayer. This is the Rick Wilson. And we are five days, five days away from Election Day. And it feels like we've been saying this for, two, it feels like two years. Like I feel like we've been in perpetual campaign mode since the inauguration. It just has never stopped. I swear <laughs> to God, if these voter fraud assholes make me miss a trip to London, in November, I'm murdering some people. I know. It's I mean that as a euphemism. Yes. Assholes. Yes. It's um, I mean, I suspect, given how close so many races are, that we are not going to know what's what with what definitively on election night. We're just not by the way, so folks, I'm not even bothering with the coffee cup tonight. I'm just going straight out of the can. <laughs> I, I'm just I'm basic. If I could have an IV drip of caffeine right now, I would. You and me both. I got like three hours of sleep last night. It's yeah. just been, it's that's what that's campaign season. And that's, campaign you know, season. that's, that's our that's world. What it's it the, is. It's the work, it's the it's the business we've chosen. Yes, yes, it is indeed. And there's a certain amount of exhilaration with it too. Exhilaration, exasperation, hope, excitement, fear and loathing. <laughs> there's there's a lot of emotion that goes into the final home stretch of a of a campaign. Dogs and but, cats living in sin together. That's right. Or dogs and cats. Uh, what's the line from Ghostbusters? I just yeah, dogs and cats living in sin together. That is that what it is? Um, yeah, mayhem. By the way, yeah. I just want to I just want to have one small Halloween throwback. Yeah. The Lost Boys is thirty five years old today. Just stop! I cannot. <laughs> I cannot. I cannot. Well, Ghostbusters is is about the same, right? 84? Yeah, Ghostbusters is older than older, the Lost Boys. Older, like I cannot. Like I, I'm a dirty dancing like person i watch it every time it comes on and right. my poor husband has to suffer through it usually um but that was 1987 like it's yeah. i i cannot i just cannot um but what we can do is we're going to break down some some of the races again we have uh philip germain with us again you know he's our lp political partnerships and research manager he was with us last week and we're going to bring philip on in a couple minutes to start uh breaking down some more of the close races and there's some other things going on too at the ballot box that's pretty interesting that if people haven't been paying attention we're going to bring it to your attention because you should know it's all it all matters um, but before we get into all of that, I want to say that there's some good news today about Paul Pelosi. He was released from the hospital. Thank goodness for that. And um, just the, the, with the utter, just abject indecency of the Republicans and how they handled this entire incident with Paul Pelosi and Nancy Pelosi has been just another one of those inflection points where you realize that the party is just, it's irreparable. It's irreparable. It's broken. It so is. And it's it's, it's just, broken. you know, if that's something like that, can't even, you can't even muster up the decency to to completely condemn it. But no, they have to turn it around, make jokes about it. That is just just another indicator of, of how far the party has fallen. Even the people who they thought were the, the good ones, they're not so good. And they showed their asses on all of this. But we're glad and, and send our well wishes to the Pelosi family that Paul Pelosi has been released and on to full that recovery. And it is great news. And and this moment, I think people will look back at this attack and they will recognize it's one more step, it's one more turn of a ratchet that the Republican Party will have a hard time moving back from. It's one more turn of, of a machine that once you agree with it and once you play along with it and once you're okay with it, you're trapped in there with it. Yeah. You, yes. you own that now. And the people from, you know, like the gentry conservatives at uh, the National Review are like, well, this attack has many question marks and, and isn't that people they. worse? No. Yeah. And it's an assassination attempt on the, um, on, on, on the, spe the Speaker of the House, that's pretty much worse. Right. And making, making it into, uh, I mean, cheesing it up into this like, oh, well, it's just gay lovers having a spat. The <laughs> levels of wrongness of that attack. Mm hmm are essentially infinite. Mm -hmm. There's so many layers of that of that attack that are that are wrong. And if you're a Republican and you think, oh, well, I can't vote for that. No, they're socialists. I can't do that. Think again. 
because you're not voting. It's not a choice between socialism and Republicans. It's a choice between cruel, conspiratorial, and insane people versus people who you may not love, may not agree with, but they're not going to try to burn the country down. They're not going to laugh mm -hmm. about, about assassination attempts and political violence. And if that, if you can't get yourself over that hump, I don't know what to tell you. Well, uh, the, the president of the United States, Joe Biden, yes, the duly elected president of the United States, he gave a, a, a speech last night uh, over at Union Station on, in Capitol Hill um, about democracy, about the defining moment that we face right now. And I'm glad that he did this because he, this has been a reoccurring theme. This is really what is at stake. And I think the president of the United States coming back out and, and laying that marker out there again to remind people right. um, was, it, was the right thing to do. And um, I want to run a, a clip of, of some of what he said. My fellow Americans, we're facing a defining moment, an inflection point. We must, with one overwhelming, unified voice, speak as a country and say there's no place, no place for voter intimidation or political violence in America, whether it's directed at Democrats or Republicans. No place, period. No place ever. This is a path to chaos in America. It's unprecedented. It's unlawful. And it's un-American. I've said before, you can't love your country only when you win. I believe the voices excusing or calling for violence and intimidation are a distinct minority in America. But they're loud and they are determined. We have to be more determined. This is no ordinary year. So I ask you to think long and hard about the moment we're in. We must, in this moment, dig deep within ourselves and recognize that we can't take democracy for granted any longer. You know, Tara, I, I have a little something to say about this, about this speech. First off, it was a very patriotic, heartfelt, balanced piece of presidential rhetoric and presidential speech making that if we lived in any different world, people would read that as an exemplar of what an, uh, what a president of either party should yes. believe and articulate. Absolutely. And I got to tell you, the response to this, I knew what the right wing would do. I knew what the right wing would do. They, their, their bullshit is their bullshit. Yeah. And it's just, it's just they, they are what they are, what they have, they have sunk to. But I have to tell you, I was, absolutely livid by the media coverage of this of this story today because i got a i got a i got a got a you know, crack of dawn like well before the well before the crows and a lot of the reporters were like oh well you know it's not going to change the race oh well why didn't he talk about inflation or gas prices folks he's talked about those a lot but if you are a reporter and you don't recognize right now this day right now that in five days you could live in a much different world. Mm -hmm. And the people that you're both sizing and pretending it's an equivalent set of values and equivalent set of beliefs and an equivalent set of, of, of truth, they don't, for one moment, have a hesitation when they take power again to put you in jail, to stop your right to report, to speak, to articulate your opinions. They will absolutely use every scintilla of power they have they will absolutely do things that you can't even bring yourselves, obviously, to imagine because the, 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 the secret sauce of American constitutional democracy is embedded in the freedom of the press. And if you think they don't hate you, if you think they won't, they won't absolutely imprison you or punish you or turn it into Peter Thiel's you know, version of, of let's make it easier to sue anyone I don't like in the press, you know, those things are coming at you because in part, you don't take the fight for democracy seriously. I, I, I don't know what to say. And I saw this very fashionable sort of cynicism about this, Tara. And I found it just unbelievably depressing and disappointing. Yeah. It's yep. like, oh, well, you know, Biden's trying to change a red wave. Step out of the horse race, folks, for five fucking seconds. You would think they would have this learned by now, a Rick. bigger problem than, than, you know, whether or not a poll in Pennsylvania shows Oz up one or Fetterman up four. It's a bigger deal 
than yep. than both sides in, it, it deserves. Anyway, just wanted to no, that. that's that's well stated because they made the same mistake in 2016. Yes, this is how we got Donald Trump in the freaking first place, because they treated him as if he were a, a a serious candidate like everyone else when he wasn't. I mean, if the media had done its job instead of uh, looking at corporate bottom lines and deciding that, well, this show is great for for our profit margin, bad for America, but oh well, um, we would have been in a much different place. So that yes, level of that level of malpractice, I, I cannot believe they're still doing this again. Um, and, and here we are, you know, I was, I was watching, um, a little MSNBC before, uh, getting ready for the show tonight. And Joy yeah. Reid was on with our friend, Nicole Wallace. And she was talking about how there's a certain level of inexplicable apathy in communities, in minority communities in Florida. Yes. And, and how given all that's at stake, people are still like, eh, yep. what, you know, I mean, <laughs> It's hard to explain, but that there is a failure there of the people who are in these communities whose responsibility it is to inform the citizens of why this is so important. That there's a failure there, and I think there'll be books written about this, given what, whatever well, the look, results are. I'm, I'm going to give my Democratic friends some tough love right now. We warned you. We've been warning you for four, year, three years now. I warned you back in 2017 when I wrote my first book mm -hmm. that the Republicans were spending the money. Yep. In Florida, where they were going to go out and slowly peel off Hispanic men, which they have done. Mm -hmm. And then they were going to peel off Hispanic women, which they are doing. And they were going to peel off African-American men of uh, 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 in a certain income range. Which they're they doing. Peel off more African-American men. Because you know what? You take their votes for granted. You take their lives for granted. You don't do shit about it. You worry about what the fucking school board, or what the fucking teachers union has to do with without thinking about what is going on in the lives of your actual voters. You take them for granted and you're going to lose huge in Florida in the Senate race and the governor's race. In part, Democrats, you don't you don't have much further to look than the fact that you don't do the work anymore. And if the DNC has any brain in their head, they will parachute down actual Floridians <laughs> they will put a, a, a separate party together because the Democratic Party of Florida cannot, as I have said a hundred times, organize a two-car motorcade and get out of its own way. Yep. This is a state where you should win a lot more than you do, but you are disorganized, you are shambolic, you are progressive where you should not be as progressive, you are you are ignoring and taking Tone for death. granted. And it's happening for Democrats in Texas, in Florida, yes. in yep. Arizona, in Nevada, in yep. a lot in North Carolina. You take your people for granted and they will be up for sale. And that's why things are as close as they are with the quality yep. of candidates on the Republican side. Um, should they should not be this close. But yes, you're right about that, Rick. And yeah. Republicans have been then planting the seeds, they've been sowing the seeds for years and years and years and years for these networks. And it's it, I mean, just four years ago. It was a 40,000 vote race for governor in Florida. 40,000 votes. That's it. Yep. That's not going to be the case this time. It's going to be a lot more than that. It, like what, what has happened since then is just unbelievable. But um, before we bring Philip in, I want to get to a couple of other headlines. Uh, Clarence Thomas back in the news. Why? Because John Eastman's emails were uncovered through, I believe, a mishap with their filing. <laughs> okay. They left the link open. If I may quote Dr. Strangelove. <laughs> These things happen. Yes. <laughs> yes, these things happen. And um, I'm glad that they did because we got some more insight into this, this dubious plot of uh, trying to overturn the election and why Georgia was such a focus in all of this because Clarence Thomas oversees that circuit in the federal court system. So they figure they're like, ah, you know, Clarence Thomas is our guy. That He's our best shot here. What was that maybe because you, of what happened with Clarence Jenny Thomas? Thomas's wife is speaking to John Eastman during this process. Yes. Texting with John Eastman during this process. And Mark Meadows. is a member of the conspiracy at various points of its development and implementation. Once again, as we pointed out several months ago, Clarence Thomas, if he had a shred of judicial ethics, would recuse himself from these cases. That's from right. From any case involving Donald Trump or one six. Right or Lindsey Graham, right. or anyone around Donald Trump. I'm sorry, folks, 
But this is this is if, if John Roberts is worried about the court's legitimacy as he should be, <laughs> he then has he the needs power. to have a, 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 some tough love with Clarence Thomas. He has the power. He could tell Clarence Thomas, "You need to recuse yourself." He can't force him to, but he can he can you know have some influence there, and that's what he should do because Clarence Thomas is clearly compromised. And I don't understand why in the hell Democrats haven't made a stink about this more because I I guarantee you if it was the other way around, Republicans I would be relentless, you, relentless I promise with you, this. if Elena Kagan was, if her husband or was Soto involved in, in, in Antifa or right. Black Lives Matter right. and they tried to overthrow the government, that there would never, ever, 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 ever be off of Fox News for a billion years. Mm -hmm. The sun would cool and the earth would be an icy crust <laughs> so before true. that story would get off Fox's. So true. Right so true. Look at what they're doing with Hunter Biden. It's the same playbook. It's the same playbook. And mm -hmm. I don't know why Democrats don't recognize it. Repetition creates reality for people. This is this is a you know a, a principle that is easily it's provable. It's a bedrock principle of yes. politics. Yes. And yet and yet another bedrock principle in politics is um, when you're facing down a, a federal case, usually people will flip. And that's what happened <laughs> with Cash Patel. Speaking of Trump flunk Trump. Snitch flunk, Patel. Snitch Patel. Hashtag it, people. Snitch yes, Patel. Yes. Has gotten an immunity deal in the Mar-a-Lago documents case. Who is Cash Patel? He is the guy that was out there saying that Trump, had, he witnessed Trump give blanket immunity for these documents. And he was there. And he was actually designated as one of the people for uh, to handle documents and deal with the, with the archives. So he was there. Now, he went running his mouth all over right-wing media. That's a whole lot different when you're in front of a court under oath. And um, looks like he had some criminal exposure here. And this is the first guy that's really in the inner circle of this whole cabal with the documents. Yeah. And so that tells me, and like a lot of our, our, our legal friends, they're like, this tells us that their target is Trump. And they gave this guy an immunity deal, so he has to testify. He cannot plead yep. the fifth on any of it. Um, and again, <laughs> people aren't going to jail for Donald Trump. Not, not, these, not these flunkies. You know, no. not, not him. So uh, stay tuned for what may. No, he, what, he what doesn't want to go to prison and where he can't wear his his black leather Lucchese gimp suit. Oh, God, where do these people come from? Where do they come from? I, I also no saw way. that Boris Boris Epstein, who's another one of these uh, fuckers, is also on the outs with the Trump campaign because he's another one that's had a lot of criminal exposure. So um, it's I didn't the, know Boris was on the fall. outs. I love that news. Oh yes, I, I had uh, not I heard sent, that. Yes, yes, we tweeted it out. I'll send you the story. But I, yes. I love that. I know we because we just can't stand. Boris it. Epstein happened to a nice Epstein is Epstein is Russian for douchebag. Yes. <laughs> no, oh my but goodness gracious. Uh, well, you know who's not a douchebag? Philip Germain. <laughs> we love Philip. Oh, we I don't know Philip. about that. <laughs> we want Philip to come and talk to us and so we can talk uh, talk some more politics because we are the, in, going into the final weekend. And uh, I think it's important to, to drill down a little bit more into some of these important races. So, Philip, I'm happy to have you back. We love you. Thank you, and I, I promise I'm not a douchebag. <laughs> <laughs> we would never allow you on. This is the, this is a no douchebag zone. So you're, we already know you're you're uh, you're always welcome, um, Philip. You've been working hard, crunching these numbers, and I want to start first with a race that I feel like has been a sleeper, and even for me, admittedly, I wasn't really even paying attention to North Carolina until about two weeks ago. And um, but I did know that Lincoln Project has had a presence in North Carolina for a couple of weeks now. Um, but I was kind of like, eh, well, I don't know. But it, this is actually a really, really close race. And uh, I want to run the, the Ted Budd ad and then we'll talk about it after. For years, Ted Budd has been in Washington. And what's he done? He took contributions from Big Oil the day before voting against a bill to ban price gouging at the pump. When there was an infant formula crisis, he voted against a bill to help families. In the pandemic, he voted against relief for North Carolina's small businesses, but his family's business took $10 million for itself. He voted against the reasonable gun safety laws that both North Carolina Republican senators supported. He voted against funding for more police officers, he voted to criminalize the choices a woman makes with her doctor. 
In all the years Ted Budd has been in Washington, he's been part of the problem. Now he wants a promotion. Ted Budd, another Washington politician. It's time for a change. The Lincoln Project paid for and is responsible for the content of this advertising. So, yeah, Ted Budd and uh, Cheryl Beasley, this is a really tight race. This is a state that Trump won by a squeaker. It was the tightest margin of victory for Trump out of all of the states. So uh, talk to us. What's happening there in North Carolina, Phil? Sure. I'm, I mean, so North, North Carolina and Ohio are both Senate races that we've been watching for a while. Uh, we're obviously doing stuff in Ohio as well. But in, in North Carolina, I think it's important to remember how close it was in, in 2020 and even on the Senate side, how leading into what became a train wreck of a Senate campaign, how close that campaign had been up to that point. And we're seeing Democrats expanding their, their vote share currently in early vote. Right now, they're leading by about 5 percent. The same time in 2020, they were leading by about 3.4 percent. We're also seeing key demographics in North Carolina, like the African-American community, expanding their vote share early vote. So these are good like signs. I, I think it's one of those sleeper Senate races. Sherry Beasley did. Uh, she outperformed other statewide electeds when she was running for the chief justice of the Supreme Court in North Carolina. And I think right. it's important, uh, especially in a cycle where you see Republicans running on crime, where you see Republicans you know, claiming Democrats are all wanting to abolish the police. Well, try saying that against a Supreme Court justice. You know? Right. Right. Exactly. And uh, she made history as the first black female Supreme Court justice of North Carolina, I believe. And so she had na uh, statewide name recognition as well. And that's what I mean by candidate quality. Same thing with Val Demings. Uh, the 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 tough not tough on crime argument doesn't really work on Val Demings. Okay? Right. And look, well, so, well, Marco may well Marco is uh, you know is looking like that race is going to go his way. I know. There's a good piece of news here, and that Val Demings is the best Democratic candidate in Florida in the last twenty plus years. Mm -hmm. And it's a sign that when they when they when they can recruit someone like that, that they can put the money together. They have to relearn the skill of campaigning, yeah. but the, it, it, it's not a hopeless cause right. in the case of, of, of pulling the right candidate. You know, if it had been, you know, rando, rando progressive from wherever, this would be a 25 point race. And since she's kept it to be a four or five point race. Yeah, which is competitive for a Democrat in Florida, given mm -hmm. the history. So. Um, okay, so that's North Carolina, folks. Pay attention if you are a viewer and you live in North Carolina. Make sure you vote and bring four, five, six of your friends and family to go vote too, because that is going to be a squeaker of a race. It, North Carolina has been an interesting, an interesting political uh, yeah. playground the last couple of cycles for all kinds of things <laughs> going on in North Carolina. So we'll be watching that. Nevada, we talked about that. Nevada, I'm sorry. Nevada. Um, Nevada. <laughs> Uh, we talked about that last week. We also, Rick and I did a, did a uh, town hall with some folks on the ground mm -hmm. there. Uh, Philip, last week when we talked about it, there were some there was some alarm about uh, early voting and, and what Dem turnout was like. What's happening now? Is it swung a little bit? Are we still nervous about this? Because the race looks really, really close for all of from Democrat, I mean, uh, governor, Senate and secretary of state. Yeah, I mean, Nevada is a state that we knew was going to be close. We knew it going into this cycle. Uh, and, and there's metrics that Democrats generally need to hit, especially in Clark County. Uh, Clark County is, is Las where Vegas. the members need to run up the margins as, as much as they can. And we've been holding out hope for that. And I, I wish I had better news to bring here. Uh, Democrats are just not building the firewall they need to. So in 2018... You know, this was when we saw Sisolak win. This is when we saw Masto win, uh, well, a couple of years before that. Uh, Masto didn't win uh, Washoe County when she won. Right. Sisolak did. So you don't want a race to come down to Washoe County if it is going to. <laughs> right. And what we're seeing right now is uh, Democrats had about a 47, 50,000 vote lead in 2018 in Clark. Right now it's 22,000. So it's well over half under what it needs to be when you take that with the republican lead in rural nevada and you, you compare those two democrats right now have maybe a 5600 vote lead uh, and yeah. 
if you know friends and you want to talk to whoever, what voters on the ground, you need to be in Nevada. You need to be calling, I think at this point, Washoe County voters, because that's what this is going to come down to. You don't want races to come down to a, a swing county in Washoe. Uh, John, uh, Ralston has been ringing the alarm bells, especially today. Yep. It's just the, the turnout margin isn't what we need it to be. We're also seeing this in the congressional district. So, so Rick and, and Tara, as you were talking about the down ballot impact, mm -hmm. you're, you're talking about the, the first congressional district, the third congressional district, the fourth out there, that's, that's Susie Lee, that's Titus, that's Horsford. Their leads are diminishing. And since we've been tracking these early vote margins, Nevada is also one of those states we talk about women leading the way in 2022, the, the post-Roe environment, women are fired up, turning out to vote. Nevada is the one state bucking that trend. Hmm. Right now, men lead the early vote in Nevada by about a point. How are they more motivated? <laughs> like, how are they more motivated than women right now? Nevada women, what's happening? Well, we're expecting another tranche of votes to come in tomorrow. Am I correct on that? There should be some more votes coming in tomorrow, but they would, they'd need a lot. They, yeah, they that, that's that's my thought too. All right, Nevada, uh, get your Nevada get is a party, get vote, by the way, where the Democratic Party was taken over by the Democratic Socialists. So everything else has to sort of be patched together <sighs> yeah. uh, at an ad hoc basis. So, yep. but do not be discouraged. Get out there. You still have a yep. full weekend. A lot can happen between now and Tuesday. So uh, get moving, Nevada. Um, speaking of being on the ground, some of our senior advisors for LP and our, our partner groups are on the ground in Wisconsin. And that race has tightened. There was a point there where I thought that, I don't know, I think Ron Johnson's running away with it. It is tightened again. The governor's race is also pretty tight. And um, these some of these Republicans, they, they just really, again, can't help but say the quiet parts out loud. Tim Michaels is the Republican running for governor in Wisconsin. And I want everyone to listen to what he said here, because this is exactly what Republicans who are election deniers, democracy deniers, and who, people who don't believe in our democratic process anymore. This is what they want to do if they get into office. That's right. Take a look. Republicans will never lose another election in Wisconsin after I'm elected governor. Republicans that are for that have no place in office. I don't care what their policy position on taxes are. We can't give power to people who have told us they won't respect the outcome of elections. This country cannot survive outside of democracy. Republicans will never lose another election in Wisconsin after I'm elected governor. My party has really lost its way. Uh, they tell us. They tell us what they're going to do, believe them the first time. Philip, how's it looking in Wisconsin? I mean, as you said, Wisconsin's tight. And Michaels hasn't done himself any favors with his stances on, on abortion and, and the bans he wants to insta institute, especially that one from 1849. That 1849. Yeah. <laughs> I just have a pro tip, a pointer politically. There's very little legislation from 1849 that works today, folks. Right. Very just call me crazy. <laughs> yeah, generally not, I, I, would, I would say. And the Democrats have, have done a good job. I, I want to say Wisconsin has one of the stronger Democratic parties when it comes to organizing. Yeah, that's not, that union. That's the union organizing out there in Wisconsin. Hey, they're doing great work on the ground, making phone calls, texting everybody with a phone, telling them to go vote. And what we've seen, at least from 2018 to, to this year, at this time in 2018, Republicans had an 11.8% lead in early vote. Okay. Democrats currently have a 4.1% early lead. You know, they nothing okay. safe. You know, Republican turnout election day is is going to be fierce. They need yeah. to run up again the margins uh, in Milwaukee. They need to run up these college students that are at you, you know, UW Madison. Yeah, I hope they I hope in Milwaukee and Dane County they are beating the drum as loud as they can. They mm -hmm. they should be. They should be pretty motivated up there. There's been a lot going on on the ground and um you know, that that's where it just comes down to getting out the vote. Who's better mm -hmm. organized? Who's who's grassroots organizing is better than the other. And that it's always where it, what it comes down to mm -hmm. getting butts into the ballots, you know, into the ballot box. So um, and what's also interesting about this, and this goes to your point, Rick, about the way the media has covered things, you know, and how the how Republicans and the conservative right media ecosystem and their organizing is just so far ahead of what Democrats are doing. This polling with this, you know, rightly leaning polling makes it look right. better for Republicans so that it's a strategy, right? So that they don't accept 
the other polls or if they lose, right? Because we all know the polling industry is in, is in going through, it's going Noisy. through some things. Yeah. Um, but this is an interesting tactic too. It, it messes with the psyche because people are like, well, how could this be? You know, conservative Republicans are winning. Look at this. And then you see, you know, if they don't win, then it's a pretext for them to claim, oh, oh see, we're not accepting the election results. Yeah, it's I mean, just, I, I interviewed um, uh, Simon Rosenberg for my podcast. Oh yeah, he's today. fantastic. And we went through a lot of these states where, you know, these these fairly junky, inexpensive, bad sample polls were flooded into the zone last week. And all of a sudden they're like, oh, the RCP average now has four polls from XYZ fly by night polling company yeah. that shows a 27 point Republican lead. I mean, there was one in New York last week. It was like, oh, Lee Zeldin's up 17. Or I'm like, what? yeah, yeah, like, OK, tell me another. Right. I mean, this is one of those things where, I mean, I'm looking at polls every day. Like I need I need those blue light glasses. I'm looking at polls <laughs> every minute of the day and you see these come across and it's like somehow Tudor Dixon is leading amongst independents by 21.3%. Yeah, no. Where yeah. did that come from? Right. Or somehow Michaels is now up 10. And, and Tara, to your point, it's, it's this pretext, right? It's this on election day. The one thing that I, I think we're doing a great job here doing is highlighting the red mirage you will see on election day, right? That's right. Yes. 2020, it's one of those things where, you know, you look at the results, you're like, oh, shit, that doesn't look great. But as the early vote comes in and the absentee ballots come in, because you have to remember, percent of Democrats are voting early. 54% of Republicans are voting on election day. So there's going to be a discrepancy there. But they're using these polls, which are horseshit, to say the least. You know, the, these are... Is that a term? Off, <laughs> yes, yes. The official term is horseshit. And they, they show obscene leads in states where it doesn't make sense. When you look at the crosstabs, you're laughing and trying to figure out how they even have a company that's doing this. Yeah. They're going to use it as a pretext. And look, I was polling up four points and I'm up right now. Stop right. the count. I'm declaring victory. Yes. And then we have to work back from that. That's right. And you know who's been the master at this? That's Carrie Lake out there in Arizona. Uh, yeah. Another state that's going to be razor thin where they have been beating this drum, beating this drum. And, you know, she's an election denier. The, the Secretary of State candidate, Fincham, is a, an Oath Keeper sympathizer, January 6th election denier, financier. Domestic terror group. The yeah. Oath Keeper domestic terror group. Exactly. Oh, which we're raging anti-Semi. We can't. Oh, yeah, that, and there's that. There's that. Oh, yeah. is that or is that Blake Masters? I don't know. There are, Is it all of the above? Yeah. Because there's, a, there's, there's so a, many. There's enough anti-Semitism in Arizona to go around. <laughs> Good grief, these yeah. people. And these are radical, insane people. A pre former President Obama was out in Arizona campaigning for Mark Kelly. Well, he took and a whack at Kerry Lake. He did. He's been on a roll, man. I'm telling you, Obama's been killing it. And uh, I'm, they thank God because the Democrats desperately need this. <laughs> yeah. And um, I, he is, between what he is doing um, with a kind of a combination of humor and, and good digs at it, but also keeping it mm -hmm. serious, like this is what's at stake in a way that people can understand. Um, and then you have President Biden, who's taking the statesman's view and, and expressing to people, this is what's at stake. We're better than this. Like, we can't let this happen. Lincoln Project has also put out something that I think is, for some people might feel like, oh, that's a shocking. It's shocking. No, it's the truth. It's called American Taliban. Take a look. They're coming for you. Millions of them. Radical, loud, dangerous, messianic MAGA zealots. More Taliban than American. Their goal is simple, to destroy American democracy, to finish what they started on January 6th, 2021, to remake our country in their image. A nation with snitches, loyalty tests, where they pick the winners in elections, tell your business how it can operate, schools, what they can teach, your family how they can worship, who you can love, what to do with your body. It's not a conspiracy or a secret. They've told us exactly what they're going to do. Radical propaganda networks amplify their lies. Stacked courts approve their actions. They'll only stop when we defeat them. And you can stop them. Your vote counts now more than ever.
that is what's at stake. That is who these people are. That is who is on the ballot all across this country for the Republican Party. You know, it, it is this the, the votes being cast on Tuesday are about do you want to be a part of them, that America, or do you want to be a part of the free and fair America that we the more you know perfect union we're all striving for, where women have equal rights, where African Americans don't have to worry about voter intimidation, where uh, you don't have uh, people who believe in conspiracy theories and and an insane uh, anti democratic belief system. Like this is this is what we're facing on Tuesday, people. And I want to say something else about January sixth. Um, you know, more and more of these of these fuckers are getting sentenced. And they're getting really long sentences, which I'm glad. Finally, justice is being served for these people. And just today, a federal judge in Washington warned of, quote, the risk of autocracy and the rise of lawlessness in America. And she sentenced another one of these bastards. She said, um, it's for U.S. District Judge Colleen kohler Cottley warned of the parallels between January 6th and the election that preceded the U.S. Civil War. This is a federal judge. People recognize what's going on here. This is not an exaggeration. Calling what we're right. facing with the other side, the American Taliban, is not an exaggeration. Right. You know, if if they want to, if they want to argue that that they don't believe in those things, the evidence, unfortunately for them, screams. The evidence is 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 blunt and apparent and out there everywhere, and you know that ad that ad we we, we argued about should we call them Taliban. But they are religious extremists. They believe that government should be in the hands of a small number of, of, of men who are going to uh, you know, act the, enact their belief system for this country. And their, their similarities are more pronounced than their differences. They want to have science without... They, 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 these people are post-science. They're post-fact. And it's the same, it's the same behavioral construct that you would see in a, in any in, in the Taliban in any one of the random stands. Mm -hmm. And Rick, I mean, I'm 25, so like I know I'm I'm on the younger side here, but something that I'm I'm stressing to all of my friends, the people I went to college with, are this election. You know, we always say this is the most important election of your lifetime. You got to vote, but they're starting to understand what happens Tuesday is going to define a decade. Sure. The map doesn't look yes. any better in 2024. And, you mm -hmm. know, the people going to the ballot box that are my age need to think about what's the country you want to raise your kids in? Are we going to have a country for you to raise your kids in? And we really need to think about that for the people that want to stay home and, and the people that think like, oh, I'm not excited because you know what? This isn't an election where it's sexy. This isn't like, you're going to get right. Medicare for all if you vote. Right. No, we're going to have a damn country if you vote. That's right. right. Well, people need to understand that. That's, That's exactly right, right Philip. Well said from, from the younger generation. We see that we're, we're, we have hope. We have hope. If it's, if it's not our generation, at least we know Gen Zers are out there paying attention and they need to be more because this is, uh, you know, we don't want to sound like it's doom and gloom because even if even if the election on Tuesday doesn't go the way we we like or the way that things look like they're going to go, it, the work still continues. It doesn't all just go like this overnight. The work still continues. We still have we still have certain rights. We still have access to things. We can still organize. There's still things that we can do moving forward. And I don't want people to feel hopeless if it becomes a scenario on Tuesday that, you know, the worst case scenario, we need to just work harder. We, you, you get up, pick yourself up, dust yourself off. And we work harder to, to fight you for this it. because we, we can't, we can't let it go. And one last thing before we, we close out tonight, since we were talking about January 6th and this American Taliban situation, you know, that, that other bastard, Stuart Rhodes, the head of the Oath Keepers is on trial as well. My and goodness. the final, that jury now I believe is deliberating or there's closing arguments. The last words that the jury heard in that case were this, quote, this is a quote from Stuart Rhodes, the head of the Oath Keepers, the same domestic terrorist group that several Republican candidates support or are members of, adjacent to, gave money to, okay? These were the final words in this trial. Quote, we should have brought rifles. We could have fixed it right there and then. I'd hang fucking Pelosi from the lamppost. That was his... That's the what that's what these people think. That's what they believe. 
And that's what we cannot allow to get into power. Any final I am words, looking Rick? forward to Stuart Rhodes going to jail for a very, very, very long time. You and, and me both. And the idea that the Oath Keepers is anything but a domestic terrorist group, when you, if you read any of the trial transcripts from this guy, any of the of the, of the messages or the information, if those if those people were Arabs, and they were saying the same thing. Uh -huh. You would want them in jail. You would want them in Gitmo. You would look at them as a proximate danger to the American uh, system. I look at them that way because they're terrorists. The Oath Keepers, the Proud Boys, the Boogaloos, they are terrorists. They're terrorists. Mm -hmm. And they need to be prosecuted for their role on January 6th, like, like Rhodes is being. They need to be sentenced. And, uh, and I really, really wish them all the best because I think they're going to find prison life to be a completely new and enlightening experience. Uh, indeed. Uh, as we close out going into this final weekend, uh, Philip, are there a, a couple of places that we want to do a call to action with the, some places we really talked about? Nevada, yeah. we talked about Wisconsin, North Carolina, Arizona. Um, is there anywhere else that we didn't talk about that you're paying attention to that you want our viewers to to know? Um, I'll give you the last word before we close out with our big, final, amazing ad that's voiced by the great Peter Coyote. So hold on for that. Final word from you, Philip. You know, I, I think you listed all of them. We need the most help we can get. Nevada, Arizona, Wisconsin, Michigan. Don't take anything for granted here. Do right. not think anything is in the bag, no matter how large an early vote lead is, that can go away. Yep. Keep calling your friends, keep calling your neighbors, sign up for those phone banks, sign up for those text banks. I'll be doing it this weekend. I'll see you there. Good. You heard it here first, folks. And Philip, we appreciate all the hard work you and your Stay in the fight, everybody. And stay in the fight. Make sure you join the union. Go to jointheunion.us if you want to sign up and find out what's going on. It's a fantastic resource. So you still have another weekend to go. Philip, we will see you, uh, I believe, next week um, on election night. We might bring you in, depending on what happens, uh, at our, on our election um, special next week. Tuesday at eight o'clock. It'll be a special time, special breakdown election edition next Tuesday at eight o'clock. As we close out, we want to leave everyone on a hopeful note because we've talked a lot of doom and gloom tonight, but we've also sprinkled in some, some, some good things and some hope. And Rick, you guys again have knocked it out of the park with a fantastic closing argument ad which the creative team does so well, called well, Country Over Party. I've got to shout out Michelle Kinney and Peter Coyote on this ad. They made this thing what it is. Uh, Michelle's our production director and creative director for the Lincoln Project. And she and Peter worked on this and, and, the, and, and our editor, uh, Joey, on this. And Joey, Michelle, and Peter, thank you so much. I could not do this job without the three of you. <laughs> and also shout out to Ben and everybody else in our production squad. Um, and Kate and Riley and, and Jeff and the rest, you guys have done an amazing job this year. We're going to keep, we're going to keep praising you guys. And unfortunately, I'm, a, I'm, a, I, I'm sorry to tell you, we probably won't get much sleep in the next week. And then after, you know, who darkens our door as a return candidate, you know, those, those, those that idea we're going to all sleep is, is, is remote, but uh, anyway, yeah. on yes. this ad, Michelle, Joey, and Peter, Absolute home run aces. I love you all. Let's see it. America thought it was better than this. Better than weaponized hate and political assassination attempts. An example to the rest of the world. Blessed with a tradition of peaceful, fair elections. Then came MAGA. Violence, hatred, and cruelty replaced the old Republican Party. When white nationalists, radical domestic terror groups, and QAnon crazies became the backbone of their MAGA party, millions of Republicans said, enough. Biden won with their support. Country over party, one last time. Soon, Trump will return. The worst of MAGA's extremist wing will dominate Washington. What you decide now decides what America looks like for a generation. You're making a choice. Their America or our America.
It's a choice, folks. Their America or our America. Vote, vote, vote like your democracy depends on it because it does. It does. Thank you so much, everybody. We Thanks, will folks. see you on Tuesday, the big day at special time, 8 p.m. Vote. Vote. <laughs>